Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another Columbus Marketing Show. As always, I am your host, Nate Riggs, and we're delighted to have you back here this week. Last week, we had the pleasure of having Mr. Dan Harris, who is at Minds on Marketing in the studio to talk about all of the creative things that they're doing in B2B, particularly around dimensional uh, direct mail. If you have a chance, go back and watch that episode. For episode number eight, we are talking with Greg, Greg Ubert, who is the president and founder of Crimson Cup Coffee and Tea. He received his Bachelor of Economics from Harvard University. He's also an author of the book, Seven Steps to Success in the Specialty Coffee Industry. Uh, and he's also very active on the Ohio State University Hospitality Management Board. Welcome to the studio, Greg. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me, Nate. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Crimson Cup Coffee and Tea has been around since 1991. Talk a little bit about your history with the business here in the Columbus market. That's correct. So uh, I decided to move back to Columbus. I was in Chicago at the time working for a computer software company and decided computer software just wasn't for me. So I wanted to do something that I was excited about, that I was passionate about, and, and coffee was, was one of those things. And also to create an environment where people were excited to be uh, at work or what's called work, right? Yeah. Um, it's really life, in my opinion. So to keep people excited about life and really learn the business, uh, learn the coffee business in the 90s, what worked, what didn't, and why in coffee bars. And you mentioned the seven steps. That's when I wrote uh, the seven steps to, su uh, to success, how to succeed, especially coffee, because I wanted entrepreneurs to succeed and to win and to do the things that they wanted to do in the community, hence, hence the book. And learned all about coffee and coffee growers and, 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 and those types of things that we are still very passionate about at, at Crimson Cup. Uh, it's just gone so much further in depth than, than my original, I guess, thinking was about the business. So you went from the software industry to the coffee industry, you write this book, which probably immersed you in kind of not just the business of coffee, but the culture of coffee in the United States. Over that time, what was it that really drew you into the industry? What did you find really kind of ignited your passion for the business? Well, I think uh, numerous things. One, taste. I mean, uh, the taste of specialty coffee, which back in 1991, it was something where I had to teach and educate folks about what was coffee because people just really most people just thought it came in a box and uh, of course now it's entirely different right we can go down the street probably into your nearest coffee house type of thing so one was taste and really saying geez i could really get into this the other piece was uh international right so having the opportunity to work with uh uh, work with folks internationally, so our suppliers, our coffee farmers, coffee growers, uh, and becoming um, knowledgeable about what it is that they do and what kind of struggles that they, they go through and how it is that we might be able to help them create a better product. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the coffee business side or our customers here in the States. A lot of them are in the States. Most of them are. Uh, most of them are small businesses, and so the struggles that they go through, how can they market properly? Uh, how can they uh, keep maintain their cost of goods? How can they do all the things that it is that's going to be needed for success? And that's what led me to writing The Seven Steps, because uh, certainly uh, we believe having a small business is a noble thing to do, and, we, and Crimson Cup wants to support that. We're going to be back with more in just a few moments from Greg Hubert. The Columbus Marketing Show is a production of NR Media Group. We change the way businesses understand and use digital media to connect with customers, earn their trust, and win their business for life. Learn more at nrmedia.biz. Folks, we are back, and we are going to go into this week's marketing insights with a little bit of a different twist. So, Greg, some of the insights that we pulled up, uh, and these numbers come from Statistia.com. There are about 50,000 stores in the U.S. that are considered to be part of the U.S. coffee and snack shop industry, and those stores generate about $27 billion in revenue. So this is a very important industry, uh, and there's some other research that I've pulled up that even say that uh, if your house is located within a certain uh, area around a Starbucks, it will increase your home value. So what has happened with the coffee industry in the U.S. in the last 10 to 15 years? Because there was a time, like you said in the opening, where you know you went to the store and you bought your coffee in a box and you made it in your coffee maker at home. How's all that changed? 
Oh, it's, it's, it's abs absolutely amazing, astronomical, right? And I think that, again, it's, it's, uh, it maybe relates to one of the reasons why I started Crimson Cup. It was, it was pretty simple, really. It was, it was like, well, shoot, if I can taste the difference between great coffee and not so great, I bet you others might too. Um, and that's really as, as, as simple as I think it needs to get because I think people, as, more options are available. The tastes are there, so there's a lot of great coffee being offered in many more places, and I think uh, that is a that's a fantastic thing. Uh, innovation um, can help in so many different ways. It's one of the things that we continually to do at Crimson Cup is the innovation of products, um, and, and I think that that'll continue to be something that we concentrate on that'll continue to grow the marketplace. I mean, my kids who are 10, 9, and 8. Um, they want to go to a coffee bar. That was just unheard of back in 91, 95, 97, 98. It was kind of getting into the college level at that point and then moving back into the high school and now it's into elementary. It's amazing. So the, uh, for the industry, it looks good moving forward. So has, you know, we see this a lot in the food industry as well. I believe it was Carl Howard was, was a guest on our, our other podcast and mentioned that kids today have a much more sophisticated palate that their parents ever did because they're exposed to so much more in terms of food. And we see mass market food like quinoa and uh, a variety of other different things that growing up I never ate. Is coffee the same way? You talk about the taste. So does this new generation who's drinking coffee in high school have a much more sophisticated palate and, and how do they know what's good coffee and what's not? Well, I think it's experience, right? So um, related to myself back in the back here in Columbus, right, in the 80s, uh, I didn't like seafood. Well, there's a reason why I didn't like seafood was because I got it in the frozen and that type of thing and that's what my parents tried to feed me it wasn't until i went to boston that had fresh seafood i'm like man this is really yeah. good right similar to coffee uh coffee great coffee just wasn't around so my first taste with coffee was on a farm out in kansas and i wanted to be a big guy right with my uh, dad and grandpa and i had coffee that was just absolutely awful because you had to put cream and sugar and pile it in. I can still remember the taste. It just yeah. wasn't that good. But now there's so many great options. So kids have taste buds too, right? And they can tell the difference between good and maybe not so good, uh, whether no matter what you're talking about in the restaurant industry, you know, all foods, uh, uh, taste for coffee, et cetera. So absolutely. You guys go to market a little bit differently than other popular coffee shops. So talk to us a little bit about the model around Crimson Cup. Yeah, the model on Crimson Cup was, uh, uh, like I said before, is more of a learning uh, in the 90s, what worked, what didn't, and why in a coffee bar. And, uh, and I just got to thinking, there are reasons why uh, places fail. So let's make sure that our customers don't do that. So don't step in that deep hole that they may not be able to get out of. So that's when I wrote the seven steps of success because I wanted our customers to have a leg up and to be strong. Shortly after though, because we were already helping our customers, I got some input from some other people uh, who said, geez, Greg, you really ought to be a franchise because you're offering as much or more than a franchise. You know, why don't you become a franchise? And I said, well, you know, I, I think the implication was we could make a lot more money. And uh, though that may be true, I don't know. But um, what I do know is that we're in a lot of small towns too. So we're in a lot of rural areas. So we're like in Iowa Falls, Iowa, and Iron Mountain, Michigan, you know, small towns of probably 10,000 or less. Okay. And I just know that they couldn't afford the franchise fees and the structures that that, that brings along. Yeah. And I wanted them to be able to have something great in the community. Because we look at coffee bars as um, certainly an outlet for us to, to, to sell our products to. However, we, we there's a bit something bigger. And we look at they can create a better community with a coffee house. That's what we believe. And uh, so to be able to offer that to many different size communities, I thought was fantastic. And so that's how we're set up. We're, we're set up purely and simply uh, for long-term relationships, really. So aside from, from the difference, obviously, in things like franchise fees, how does Crimson Cup's relationship with partners vary from that of a typical franchise? Well, I think... Uh, I, 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 we um, don't require uh, uh, our customers, uh, I guess we're not 
telling them to do everything. We will, we respect them as, as individuals and we say, look, here's what worked for us. So we do have plenty of empirical data to share with them. And we think that they will, or their common sense, so we think that they'll make a common sense decision based upon their needs. So for instance, if we're coming out with a new product, uh, say, you know, hand poured coffees, it's worked very well at Crimson Cup. I mean, that's what I uh, built Crimson Cup for up in Clintonville, is to test and try things so that what worked, we can put out in their community yeah. of coffee houses, and what didn't, we would also share that too. Uh, you know, we have no problem sharing our faults because we don't want our customers to go into that realm either. Right, so the stuff that works, we want them to implement. And we say, look, here's how we did it, here's what we did. Um, now you can uh, have, should have similar success if you implement these things the way we did. So this coffee market is extremely crowded. There's probably thousands of different types of products and, and a ton of different brands out there all marketing the same thing. How do you stand out in such a crowded market that some would consider to be a commodity? What, what makes Crimson Cup innovation or innovation uh, something to, to keep you going forward man it's so funny you, uh, you asked that question because I'm thinking back to 1991 when people told me what are you doing why are you getting out of computer software nobody cares about coffee uh, the people just don't care about that right it's commoditized so it's interesting that we're what 24 years later talking yeah. about the commoditization of specialty coffee it's really interesting However, you know, what we do with our customers is we get them to reach into the community because it's, um, that's so important. If they're truly about the community, which most of our customers are, then they're reaching into their community and saying, hey, come here. This is a, this is a, a place to come and get a great drink and also share what's going on in the community. So we show our customers how to grassroots market and how to make those connections. Those connections are so important because they're relationships, right? So creating those relationships and knowing how to create those relationships certainly help our customers. I know you have a lot of tips and obviously experience in terms of helping coffee shop owners really become successful. Uh, you've got at least seven of them. So from that list, what are the most important? If, if I'm a small business owner and I would imagine that a coffee shop is somebody's dream somewhere, um, what do you recommend to them? How do they get started and how do they move down towards building a successful business? Well, we really take them from the idea or the thought that, hey, I want to open up a coffee bar. And our processes are, are such so that we kind of, we don't work with everybody, right? Because not everybody should run a business, yeah, right? They, they shouldn't. Uh, and so our processes work those folks out of the business. That's very important. Why is that important? That's important for Crimson Cup because our name's very important. While it might not be Crimson Cup in, you know, uh, West Texas, a store in West Texas, guess what? They're supplying our, our cups. We we're kind of act as the intel inside there, if you will, right? So people kind of know it's us, even though it might be somebody else's name up there, yeah. right? But all that is is just, you know, so very important that uh, that we have them set up for success. So finding a location. Very important, okay? We've whittled it down to really two things now. I'll get into some other steps in a second, but really we need to find the right person for us that works for us that wants to follow our experience. Yeah. And then we need to put them in the right location because after that what we do is set up their, set up their coffee bar for efficiency. So how the layout of the store is so important. Okay. It eliminates labor costs, increases the customer experience, right? If we can put out a drink faster, the ones that should be put out faster, if we can put out those faster, that's great. If we can have an experience on the brew bar, or what we call the brew bar, hand poured coffees, um, and show them how to do that, that's fantastic, right? But it has to be set up efficiently, okay? Having the right equipment, right? That we show people how to do, have the right equipment, how to engage somebody, not only in the store, in the store is very important, also how to do stuff outside the store, which is what we call what I call the big rocks, grassroots marketing. Yeah. How do you go about doing that? And then some of the other steps included there. So it's really kind of a soup to nuts, and, and, and we continue to um, continue to educate, right? Because uh, I've never known anybody successful to say I've learned everything that I need to learn. I don't need to learn anymore. So yeah. we're continually learning ourselves, and also uh, our customers are learning as well, and we're helping them with that. From, from the standpoint of, of successfully launching a new coffee house, how important are the baristas? And, and 
if they are important, how does a new coffee owner, coffee shop owner, find the right barista for their, their store? Well, um, baristas are, are very important, extremely important. The management of them is extremely important. So how happy they are is how happy the store will go, right? And how, tra how well trained they are is how, how the store will go for the most part. Right, so that is something that we do spend a decent amount of time on. As a matter of fact, we're building another, uh, you know, one of our buildings um, is we're remaking into a larger training facility, um, roasting lab, test kitchen, so we can innovate on products and so that we can teach and train our customers more. Because, you know, the, uh, we need, uh, we're gonna have uh, larger facilities in order to do that, because teaching and training is so important across yeah. all aspects of the business. So you mentioned this, this lab. Uh, what is coming down the pipeline in the coffee industry that's innovative, and what are you guys working on that, that's kind of pushing the boundaries in terms of that coffee experience? Uh, well, we, um, we did get some press recently about, uh, you know, it's a nitrogen-infused coffee. Uh, we did a, a dry hop coffee, so it pours like a, pours like a Guinness. There's no alcohol in there. Okay. It's cold coffee, pours like a Guinness. So that's uh, at our coffee house right now, and that's kind of... Um, definitely rare uh, in the industry to have that. And I, I tell you, we just came out with another one that's uh, cocoa nib. So it has, uh, it tastes, you know, has cocoa in it, chocolatey okay. notes. And we teamed that with one of our, uh, one of our friends in, in, in Guatemala, farmers. It's a great kind of chocolatey uh, type of coffee and add, add some of the nibs, it's unbelievable. So that'll be available too. So we're gonna continue to innovate on coffee and tea as we move forward, smoothies, any, any yeah. kind of uh, drink within a coffee bar, we're gonna continue and we're, gonna, we're excited to have this facility so we can just do more of it. Excellent. If you were leaving tips for anybody that wanted to not just get into the coffee business, but get into business for themselves as an entrepreneur, much like you have done, uh, looking back, what, what would you have done differently and what would you recommend to them? Hmm. Uh, well, wow. I, I think uh, certainly, and, and you hear this, you know, you're going back to, you know, Woody Hayes here, you win with people, that's absolutely 100% true, right? And how you go about doing that is, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one, really. Yeah. That's probably the, the, what I hear most from entrepreneurs is how do I get the right people? Yeah. You know, how do I get them on, on board? How do I keep them? How do I keep them happy? How do I do, do all those things necessary? And I think it's, I, I think it's a, a learning thing something that is, is probably personal, personal to every entrepreneur. Yeah. How, they, I, intrinsically, I know that, you know, I know that 100%, and I believe that, there's no question about that. It's just that it's not as easy yeah. as that, right? And, uh, uh, but that's what makes it what it is, right? Once we have the right people and always excited, because I've always had excited people, you know, uh, willing to come down, that's never been an issue. I've, you know, for whatever, maybe it's coffee, I don't know. But it, it has been exciting to, to, to share with uh, people who are excited about what they do. That yeah. is, uh, that's fun. So we, we have a lot of Columbus listeners on the show who are probably very familiar with Crimson Cup. Uh, but for those who aren't or those who are out of the general Columbus area, uh, what's the best way that they can find a Crimson Cup coffee house near them? Well, I, I think there's, there's, they, they probably have to some extent, whether they're, we're in all places of, of Columbus, we're in uh, especially retail operations or especially grocers, we're in, uh, in uh, restaurants here in central Ohio, we're in coffee bars uh, in, in central Ohio as well. So there's, there's a lot of different avenues to, to find them and, and uh, we just hope that what it is that we're doing with our, uh, with our laboratory, our coffee laboratory, uh, that we'd love to have them uh, come visit us. Okay. Well, we're delighted to have you on the show this week, and best of luck to you guys as you kind of grow the chain and, and spread good coffee around the United States. All right. Thank you, Nate. Thank Appreciate you. it. Cisco estimates that by 2018, video will represent 79% of all internet traffic, Take your marketing program to the next level by engineering video content libraries that are strategically designed to drive traffic, convert customers, and build lasting brand loyalty. Get a sneak peek of the Video Engineering Playbook, a new book by Nate Riggs. Download your free sample chapters by clicking this link. 
Folks, that is all the time that we have for today. My special thanks to our guest, Greg Hubert from Crimson Cup Coffee and Tea. You can find them uh, in a variety of places around where you are. So be looking for the logo. And, and if you have not tried their coffee, uh, give it a whirl. I think you'll like what you taste. Come back next week. We're going to be talking with John Eli, who is the director of marketing at Amatech. The Columbus Marketing Show is filmed live in our studio at 454 East Main Street in downtown Columbus. Uh, and you can find this show, the video version of it, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash NR Media Group, all in word. You can also listen to the audio of the show on Speaker.com or on iTunes. And catch this week's show notes and post on NR Media News, where we'll have some links to Crimson Cup Coffee as well as the book. And special thanks to the NR Media Group production crew, Nate Marshall, production director, Alex Foley, content manager, and Melissa Christian for setting up all the logistics of the show. And as always, I am your host, Nate Ray. And I will see you back here next Friday at 6 a.m. for another Columbus Marketing Show.